All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar today on uh, the NIDDK as a source of non-dilutive funding. Uh, my name is Jonathan Adelist from the Freemind Group, and I'll get, be giving you the webinar. Um, before we begin, a few uh, housekeeping issues. First of all, uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, so you can absolutely feel free to, to share that with anybody you think may be interested. Additionally, the, the slide deck itself will be sent out to all registrants, uh, so you'll be receive, uh, receiving a copy of that as well. And again, do feel free to share that. Um, and additionally, uh, at the end of the webinar, I will be taking questions, so feel free to type in some questions, and I will address as many of those as I can when we reach the uh, end of the webinar. Uh, so uh, let's begin. Um, now, um, a few words about uh, who's actually speaking with you today before we actually get into the, the webinar itself. So uh, the Freeman Group um, is, a, is a consulting firm, and we specialize in helping our clients raise uh, funding from non-dilutive sources. Uh, we've been around since 1999, about 55 full-time employees. We work across the industry, uh, academics, uh, university medical centers, uh, and the industry itself, obviously. Uh, everything uh, from very small seed stage startups and all the way to big pharma. And we submit at the moment about 400 to 450 applications a year. It actually looks like this year we're going to exceed that, so uh, in the future you may see a higher number on our slides. Um, but regardless, um, the way we view uh, not only funding and the way we actually we view ourselves is a tool to help you maximize your funding potential, and we do that essentially through a strategic uh, approach toward non funding, and that begins with identifying the most relevant sources of funding for, for whoever uh, is applying for that uh, funding, strategizing to maximize each application's chances of success and, and, and making it sure it correlates with the interests of the funding agencies and the way it's presented, managing complex uh, project production processes, many multifaceted, multi-PI uh, projects, things like that. Uh, we lead the joint application writing and support any final contract negotiations when relevant. Um, in terms of what the actual pocket of money is, so uh, currently it's just a bit over $50 billion a year that are available in the form of non dilutive funding in the United States. And I should say in the United States uh, in the sense that it is from U.S.-based sources, definitely not exclusively available for U.S. Uh, applicants. Um, but uh, generally speaking, uh, that's divided into the NIH uh, within the HHS and it's 27 institutes and centers, and we will be focusing specifically on the NIDDK within that group uh, today. Uh, other AGS uh, sources of funding are BARDA, the FDA, the CDC, NSF. There are various sources of funding within the DOD as well, and also private foundations. Uh, so it really is a vast source of funding. And, and uh, somebody pointed out to me lately that actually, if you look at that, uh, it's more than the entire VC community put together. Now, that's not to say you should not approach VCs, obviously, for funding. But I, I would say that that points to an interesting fact. And, and maybe the, the take-home message here is that it is maybe a larger mistake than many would have thought uh, to neglect this source of funding. Uh, looking specifically at the NIH budget, uh, now this is by no means the only source of funding, but it's definitely the most major one, the large source of funding. Their budget this year is $32.31 billion, with a B. Um, and out of that, actually about $27 billion go out to external research projects. So it is a huge source of funding for R&D in the life sciences. And uh, again, our focus today will be the NIDDK. Um, and maybe I should go back and, and mention this at least once. Uh, the NIDDK is the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. Uh, now we'll cover in a second exactly the scope of science they cover, but that is uh, the acronym. Um, and it is, in terms of a background on the NIDDK, one of the five largest institutes within the NIH. And that is saying a lot because, like I said, the, the pocket of, uh, of money there is, is fairly substantial. Uh, and they support research, and this is what I was alluding to, on kidney, urologic, hematologic, digest digestive, metabolic, and endocrine diseases, as well as diabetes and nutrition. Uh, 
Uh, so a fairly wide area of science can be covered uh, through funding mechanisms from the NIDDK, as you can see here. And to put uh, some numbers uh, behind that, uh, their budget for 2016, and this is a next budget, uh, is over $1.8 billion. And this is specifically for these indications. Um, and, and breaking that down a bit further, um, so of the $1.82 billion budget this year, about $1.56 is actually devoted to extramural research, meaning goes out and not funding the NIDDK itself or projects that they are advancing internally, but actually projects of external organizations that are applying for funding from them. And breaking that down a bit further, uh, so the budget for diabetes, endocrinology, and metabolic diseases is about $641 million this year. Digestive diseases and nutrition, uh, $483 million. Kidney, urologic, and hematologic diseases, uh, $439 million. So you can see these are very, very large numbers. Uh, and this is a very major source of funding for anyone in this area of science. Uh, and what I would like to do next is break down some of the specific mechanisms you could use if you are uh, in this area of science to try and fund some of your in-house R&D projects. And I'll start with some SBIR and, ST and STTR mechanisms. Um, the first one I would like to speak about is uh, called Lead Optimization and Preclinical Development of Therapeutic Candidates for Diseases of Interest to the NIDDK. And, and you'll see this repeating uh, in many of their mechanisms. They have some more uh, specific uh, and, and I guess uh, pinpointed uh, mechanisms that I they issue for a specific indication or a specific uh, type of solution. But many of their in, uh, calls for applications will be fairly broad and essentially can be used to fund anything that is aligned with their mission or anything that is within scope or within the interests of the NIDDK. And you can go on the NIDDK website to, to find a very uh, exact definition of that. But broadly uh, discussing it, it is exactly what I covered earlier. Uh, and, and going back to that for a minute, uh, so it's essentially uh, kidney, urologic, hematologic, digestive, metabolic, and endocrine diseases, and diabetes, and nutrition. So um, there, this is a phased mechanism, meaning you can submit a phase one, a phase two, or a fast track. Uh, phase one is for uh, fairly preliminary work, early stage research, uh, and that's reflected obviously in the budget. And it covers one year of funding and up to $225,000. Um, phase two, in this case, is contingent upon receiving a phase one. So you can only receive uh, or actually apply for the phase two after you've uh, received a phase one and, and successfully carried out the research. And that is up to $1.5 million over two years. Uh, something you can do additionally is if uh, you want to apply for the phase one and the phase two at the same time, you can do that. It's called a fast track. And essentially, uh, there are a couple advantages of, of going through the fast track mechanism. First of all, uh, it's not a competing renewal, meaning you do not have to compete to receive the phase one once you're, you've finished the phase two, to receive the phase two once you've received the phase one, rather. Um, so first of all, the phase two is guaranteed if you complete the phase one successfully. And Additionally, there's the, in terms of the timing, there's an advantage because essentially if you do submit a phase one, complete it, what you would do if you did not submit a fast track is then start working on uh, submitting a phase two and then you submit the phase two on the next deadline and then you have eight months until you actually hopefully receive the funding. Uh, so it eliminates that time gap uh, and that is a very positive thing in many cases. Uh, that means that there are also situations where we would advise to submit just a phase one uh, and that's something that really has to be discussed in in much more detail per application. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, this is a mechanism uh, that is very widely used with small businesses. The next deadline is January 5th, uh, so we have some time until that is upon us, but not too much, especially considering the holidays. Uh, so you should definitely consider starting and work on that uh, very, very soon. Uh, applications in this case should definitely be milestone driven. SBARs are always milestone driven, means, meaning you have to set uh, a, a clear um, list of the milestones to be achieved and one will be following another. Um, this also has an STTR equivalent. Uh, SBARs uh, are uh, for small businesses, STTRs are for collaborations. It's te uh, technology transfer, so it's basically for a collaboration between an academic institution and a, a for-profit uh, organization. Um, and both uh, of those are available. 
the, there are a few additional um, SBARs that, as I mentioned, are much more specific in their scope. And I'd like to mention a few of those that I think are noteworthy. Um, SBIR and CTR to develop new diagnostic monitoring and therapeutic technologies for complications of type 1 diabetes. And, and the reason I put SBIR slash SCTR there is because there are both an SBIR and an STTR available, not because these two are the same mechanism. There are two separate mechanisms. One is an SBIR, one is an STTR. Um, and there's an SBIR for new technologies for viral hepatitis and a uh, kidney precision medicine project. Uh, so if you're in one of those specific areas, and these would be fantastic opportunities for you. And, and, and all of these uh, should have a deadline coming up in January as well. Uh, another mechanism uh, worth mentioning in this context, and this is basically what you should use if you do not have something that is aligned with, uh, you did not find, you are within the area that is interesting to the NIDDK, but none of the previously mentioned SBARs or STTRs are necessarily something that is aligned in terms of the scope they would cover uh, with what you're doing. Um, and this is an omnibus uh, SBIR. Um, and besides being completely open in terms of the scope, um, the, one of the additional advantages here is that it, this does allow a direct to phase two that is not available in previously uh, presented uh, opportunities. Uh, and uh, noteworthy that the, the direct to phase two is actually not the exact same uh, mechanism code, but it is available uh, through uh, this uh, uh, opportunity. And um, basically what that means is if you have completed phase one equivalent research, not necessarily funded by an SBT, SD, SBIR or STTR, you can uh, file an application for a direct to phase two and go immediately for the 1.5 million over two years and not start with the 225 over one year. So in many cases, if that is what is relevant for you, we would advise uh, using this mechanism. A caveat there though is that um, literally I think about a week and a half ago, the NIDDK issued um, a notice that they would not use this mechanism to fund clinical trials. Now, as part of that notice, they uh, acknowledge the fact that they are interested in funding uh, clinical trials through SBIRs. Uh, and basically what they said is that they will be issuing um, various specific calls for clinical trial um, projects uh, in the near future. So actually, you should not view this as, as them not being interested in funding uh, clinical trials in their area of interest. They're just ch changing the way they do that. And actually, we're seeing this in general in the NIH, that they're focusing over the last uh, few months, definitely, but even over the last year, uh, even more and more on clinical trials. So this is actually something we see as, as, as a positive, and you should not be deterred by this fact in any way. Uh, that being said, maybe January 5th, if you are looking to fund uh, a clinical trial, maybe a bit premature since I do not uh, think that the new mechanisms will be issued in time to submit them. I could be wrong, but at, at the moment we do not think that is going to happen. So uh, non-SBIR uh, opportunities. So we'll start with some uh, opportunities that are relevant for preclinical research. And the first one I'd like to discuss is an assay development and screening to discover therapeutic or imaging agency, agents for diseases of interest to the NIDDK. And, and you're seeing this again, the diseases of interest to the NIDDK. Again, they keep it fairly broad in terms of scope. Obviously, you should not submit an oncology project here. But if it is within the areas we've discussed that are interesting to the NIDDK, then there's no specific area that would say, no, this is not interesting to us. Although it should be assay development or screening, uh, because obviously that, that is what they're looking for in this mechanism, even though uh, you could be uh, within scope in terms of the indication. You should make sure you're within scope in terms of the type of activity in this case. So uh, this mechanism uh, is interesting, and there are a few here that we'll discuss today, uh, in, in respect that there is no budget cap. Now, that by no means uh, is uh, an authorization to say, OK, I want $50 million if the cost of your project will be four. Um, or, or, or Definitely not if it's less than that. But but I guess the take-home message here is there is no number that is too high categorically. You just definitely have to justify what you are asking for. Uh, but if you establish interest and excitement on their end, they, there's no number that is too high for them. 
all that being said, it's there's definitely some uh, um, risk mitigation as far as they're concerned. And investing uh, 15 million is much more of a risk than investing uh, 500,000. So they would have to be very interested to fund you uh, on that level, but it is definitely possible and it has happened. Um, so essentially this mechanism can be used to develop, validate, or conduct a screening, uh, a screen using a novel assay to identify therapeutic or imaging agents relevant to health-related outcomes of interest to the NIBPK. Uh, and, and, and essentially they would expect at the end of the period to have developed and validated a novel assay or uh, identified a prototype uh, therapeutic or imaging agent. Uh, so that, that is basically what you're expected to achieve by the end of the funding period. Uh, and the funding period here can be up to five years, by the way. Uh, so it, it's not something that has to be immediately available. But it, again, in the, the plan you lay out with the specific aims and essentially the, the, the project that you are proposing for them to, to, to fund, that would need to be the end goal within those five years. Um, and by the way, the, the deadline here is February 5th of next year, so again, uh, definitely a, a ample time to produce an application, but I wouldn't put it off uh, too much. Uh, the next um, preclinical opportunity uh, that I would like to discuss is titled uh, Early Stage Preclinical Validation of Therapeutic Leads for Diseases of Interest to the NIDDK. Um, and this is very straightforward, uh, preclinical validation of therapeutics. Um, this is fairly broad, both in terms of what you can fund, any uh, type of early preclinical activities, and uh, anything that is of interest to the NIDDK. So, so of the vast majority of clients that are at a preclinical stage that come to us and look for funding that is in the areas of interest to the NIDDK, in many, many cases, this is the mechanism we would be using with them. Um, or at least one of the mechanisms, obviously, we will be using with them. Uh, and the next due date here is February 5th. This is a fantastic opportunity. Again, I'll repeat myself this time, but I will maybe refrain from doing that in the future. Uh, there's no budget cap here. That does not mean you should ask for an astronomical number. It means there's nothing that is too high, but you have to justify what you are asking for. Uh, and we're moving on to, to clinical stage funding. Um, so uh, the NIDDK is, 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 is fantastic about funding clinical stage uh, research. And, and uh, that's, I guess, touching back on what I said earlier about uh, the SBIR mechanisms and them not currently using the, SBI, the omnibus SBIR rather, to fund clinical activities. Um, uh, and maybe to emphasize my point about this not being a matter of their interests shifting away from um, clinical trials, but just of a, a shift in the way they do that through the SBAR programs, you can see that within the non-SBAR programs, there, there is a huge amount of opportunities for clinical research, and, and, and that, I guess, is, is a good way to, to uh, gauge their interest in clinical trials. Uh, so, so we'll start with um, a U34. U34 are a, a clinical trial impl planning uh, grants. Um, and this one is titled NIDDK Multicenter Clinical Trial, Clinical Study Implementation Planning Cooperative Agreement. Uh, and, and basically, this is a mechanism that's very special in this respect because you can use this mechanism not to fund the clinical trial itself, but to plan, to, to fund rather, the planning of the clinical trial. Uh, and this can be used to, to, to uh, fund early peer review of the rationale, um, assessment of the design of the protocol, uh, development of all the necessary documents, anything else that's an early element that is required for the conduct of the clinical study, and in many cases, even some very, very early data um, that would be important to for, for you to take that into account and, and, and construct the clinical trial. Um, the funding cap here is $450,000 over two years, not per year, so $450,000 in total. And it can be obviously also in one year or less as well, but the cap is up to two years. Um, very interesting mechanism. Um, not many sources of funding uh, fund things like planning a clinical trial. Uh, and the deadline, the next deadline here is January 5th. Worth mentioning here that unlike many of the other mechanisms, this does not have three uh, um, deadlines a year. 
uh, only two a year, so it may be worth um, <laughs> getting down to business and, 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 and trying to make the January 20th deadline if this is something that in terms of the stage of development could be relevant for you. In terms of the scope of research and activities, so it has to be a multi-center clinical trial and uh, it has to be in an area of research that is relevant to the NIBDK. But besides that, it is fairly broad in terms of the scope. Uh, now, they have a set of uh, mechanisms uh, for pilot and, and early stage clinical trials. And um, I'll discuss the first one, and then I'll give you a list of various other specific uh, mechanisms. Uh, and this, uh, again, is designed to fund uh, very small scale pilot studies, not, not a full blown clinical trial. And that's obviously reflected in the budget here, 275 in direct cost, which usually means 350,000 to 385,000 total um, when you take the indirect cost into account. Um, that, that is uh, with, with uh, a for-profit organization standard overhead uh, ratio. If, if, uh, if you have a negotiated rate uh, as part of a university, uh, that could be much higher. Uh, well over 100%, so it would be uh, easily uh, 500, 600,000 in that case. Um, but I wouldn't have, would not necessarily advise doing it that way, even if you are collaborating with an academic institution. And this is not really uh, getting very specific, but it may be worth mentioning that uh, when, when, the, uh, when the organization applying is a for-profit organization, then the overhead or the indirect costs goes directly to the company as well. And it is usually 30 or 40 percent of the direct costs and not 100 and something percent, um, unlike, unlike the case with universities or academic institutions. But even if you're collaborating with an, a lab at a university, they would not actually be receiving uh, the overhead uh, themselves. It would go directly to the university itself. And uh, it's very hard to see a penny of that. So even though you would be receiving a higher rate, you would actually probably not receive any of the funds. So uh, we would typically advise against that. But again, it should be judged on a per project basis. Um, generally speaking, this supports short term, and this would be true for any of the next mechanisms I'm going to mention, short term clinical trials in humans to acquire preliminary data and or refine power calculations that would lead to a larger, more definitive study. Um, and and uh, essentially, this is relevant for clinical trials in diabetes, endocrine, and metabolic diseases. And the deadline is February 16th. Um, but as I mentioned, there are a few additional ones. So there's an almost identical uh, mechanism that funds uh, uh, research in digestive diseases and nutrition, another one for brains and uh, kidney diseases, another one for urologic disorders, and another one for obesity. So uh, if you are in any of these areas and you're considering conducting an early preliminary trial, this could be a fantastic mechanism to get funding for that. And this is the, really the, the major mechanism they use for funding clinical trials. And, and as I mentioned, you see there are a lot of different mechanisms here to fund clinical trials, and that really is a reflection of their interest and their growing interest in uh, clinical trials. Um, so essentially, this uh, funds any multicenter clinical trial that is, in terms of the scope, uh, uh, relevant to the mission of the NIDDK. Um, and uh, the budget here is not capped. Uh, this is a cooperative agreement. So unlike an R01, where it is just a pure grant, a cooperative agreement essentially means it's a bit more hands-on uh, from the side of the funders from the, the NIDDK. Now, that does not mean they make any decisions for you, but they do like to keep um, getting updated. They, have to, they, they really do like to have a good understanding of what's happening. They also would probably like to be involved at least uh, on the level of, uh, of updates in terms of uh, looking at, at the protocol, uh, maybe even suggesting things in the protocol. And again, the decisions are absolutely yours. It's your science, it's your project. Um, but they like to have a bit of input in this case. And usually in our experience, most of our clients have found that to actually to be very helpful because essentially what you're getting here is some of the top uh, experts in the field, in the world, giving you advice on your clinical trial for absolutely no cost, uh, which, you know, it's um, it's sometimes the, the phrase hands-on can be uh, a deterrent, but if you look at it that way, uh, I'm sure you, you would agree that, that 
it's something that could be very valuable. Um, regardless, uh, there is no budget cap here. Again, you have to justify what you asked for, but since this is funding uh, major clinical trials, we are talking about multi, multi-million dollar awards here. Um, and the next deadline here is February 5th, so get to that. This especially, since it is such a, a large award and they fund a, a very um, extensive amount of research in this case, they would ask that you reach out at least eight weeks in advance uh, to start discussions with the program officer. And, and we strongly advocate doing it at least eight weeks in advance. Uh, so since February 5th is not that far in the future, if this is something you are considering, I would highly recommend reaching out as soon as possible. In terms of the review process itself, um, the NIH works uh, on a system where they essentially have five criteria for um, the review, uh, leadership, environment, significance, innovation, and scientific approach. Uh, and essentially what they're doing is they are, uh, it's, it's a risk management process. Uh, they are weighing the strengths of your application against the risks. Um, and, and you have to absolutely make sure you are responsive, meaning you are a good fit to what they're looking to fund, but also competitive in, in terms of what, you know, producing a solution or that would be um, A, significant if it is successful, and B, uh, mitigating the risk as much as you can. Um, so the answer in terms of um, do you have the right leadership in place, do you have the right environment, is it significant? Is it uh, innovative? The answer absolutely has to be yes, but what really will get your application funded is always the scientific approach. Uh, and, and it really is immensely important to present a, a top-notch scientific approach. Um, the way to maximize your chances uh, is, is first and foremost uh, to know the interests of the agency. You have to present a complete and focused application, meaning you have to cover all the necessary aspects, um, but not shoot in all directions. Make it focused and, and, and to the point. Um, ask for what is necessary in terms of the budget. Uh, don't ask for too much. Uh, that will be scrutinized. Uh, don't ask uh, for much less than what it would cost also, because that will be viewed as you not really understanding uh, what this would entail. Um, and leverage on research collaborations when necessary. Uh, don't throw in names just to name drop and have them not really do much for the application or not be very relevant in terms of the science itself. Um, and that, that, I guess touches back to the point on present a complete focused application. You have to cover all the necessary facets. So if there's a hole in your capabilities, by all means collaborate with somebody who can gap that bridge in your capabilities but don't collaborate just to collaborate. Um, and and uh, furthermore, um, target the right mechanism. There are a lot of different pockets of money, as, you, if, as you've seen, and obviously I did not present the entire scope of, possible, of opportunities. There are different sizes of awards and success rates. You have to conduct a thorough strategic assessment to understand where the right places to apply are. And we strongly advise a multi-submission granting strategy, meaning not just submitting one and waiting around and hoping your application will be awarded, but submitting multiple applications to various different sources of funding. We find that really is the only way to truly maximize your chances of actually receiving the funding. Uh, our professional process uh, is basically uh, consistent of two uh, core uh, processes. The first one is uh, strategic consulting, and that has to do with uh, essentially many of the things I mentioned, uh, getting in touch with the program officers, understanding what all the, the relevant sources of funding for any given project are, mapping that out, and really creating a strategy on how to move forward and what to submit and when. And the second um, process is, is actually producing the applications, and these two go round and round keep looking at the landscape and keep producing more and more applications. That really is the way you maximize your potential for this type of funding. Um, and this is basically what I touched on. Uh, our process for the client starts with their uh, R&D funding needs. 
Based on that, we create a multi-submission strategy looking 24 months forward. Uh, in the short term, we look at the next six months and decide really what projects we're going to produce and start working on them. Uh, we work on them, uh, produce the applications. Those applications are reviewed, hopefully uh, favorably and awarded and we go back to uh, looking at the needs and, 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 and strategy, and that is essentially an ongoing process. So um, that has been the webinar on the NIDDK. I hope uh, I've been able to touch on both what the NIDDK uh, are interested in and what specific mechanisms are in a way that would be useful and interesting. Um, like I said, the slides will be available. Um, and uh, essentially, um, you can view the entire webinar again. Uh, it will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. Feel free to reach out to me directly if you have any specific questions, uh, even something specifically for your organization, your research specifically. I'm more than happy to discuss anything like that. Um, and let me just address a few questions here before we end. There are a few things here that are very specific, and that's something I'd be happy to address by email. Um, but let's see here or something. Yes, okay. First of all, in terms of the SBAR mechanisms, there's a question here. Yes, SBARs are only for US-based for-profit organizations. This is true for STTRs as well. Uh, the other mechanisms, the R21, R01, U01, all of those are typically open with no geographical restrictions. Uh, so if you are based in the U.S., you can utilize all of those. If you are based in, in any other geography, you basically should start looking at the mechanisms uh, I presented after the SBIR CDR section. So both the preclinical and the clinical mechanism I mentioned, um, all of those would be applicable for a non-U.S. Uh, organization. Um, let me see here. I have a question here, would you advise uh, applying to several grants for the same clinical trial? Yes, absolutely. So um, you have to know how to do that because um, with the same source of funding, uh, namely the NIH as an example, you can't submit the same project twice. So you can't take a specific clinical trial and fund it, try to fund it twice within the NIH or within the NIDDK with two separate mechanisms or definitely not with the same mechanism. Uh, something you can do is use separate sources of funding uh, and apply to both of those. As an example, something that is uh, fundable from the NIDK is in many cases fundable also through uh, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs or various private foundations. Uh, so you should absolutely do that. Um, additionally, there's something that we try to do in many cases to maximize chances of award, and that is playing around with the specific aims and, and the protocol. Uh, as an example, uh, slightly different populations, uh, variations in the actual indication itself, uh, and if you submit two applications that are very similar but di distinct in that fashion, then you can actually submit more than one to the same source of funding, and actually even uh, collect more than once because it's not the same set of activities. If you had submitted uh, the way I described earlier, the, same, the exact same clinical trial to multiple sources, you can absolutely submit, but you cannot collect more than once. That, that is, you know, it's fraud. Um, let me see here. Um, there are a few questions here that are very, very specific, uh, and again, Anybody with um, with a very specific question, more than happy to address that over email or even over a phone call, and you're free to call me, send me an email, anything like that. But I'd rather not go into things that are that detailed uh, at this point. Um, let me just make sure, are these all of the NIDDK uh, mechanisms? No, these are not. Uh, I, I selected these um, because I thought they were, these may be the most interesting and relevant. There are various others, and, and uh, if you did not see something that's relevant for you, although if you are in this area of research, I, I highly doubt that because the scope of many of them is fairly wide. But if you did not find something that is a good fit, then I highly uh, recommend going on the NIH website and, and searching there. Um, okay, 
I, th I think we can uh, we can finish here. Uh, and again, there are a few additional questions that I'd be happy to answer over email. Um, but regardless, thank you very much for your time. I hope you found this to be uh, informative. And uh, log in to our next webinar that will be coming shortly. Thank you very much.